so we can post this on our YouTube as usual um, once this is complete. So before we get started, I just wanted to talk about a few reminders coming up with Audubon and just highlight a couple other things. So Zach Sutton has started some parks or some walks at Weaver Park uh, starting about mid-September. These have been occurring every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. Um, Zach and Aaron led the first two, and Zach is leading the one on Saturday. And then Michael Ward, Dr. Michael Ward is leading the second one on the 14th, and I'll also be leading one on the 21st. And these all start at 7.30 from the Weaver Park, uh, sorry, 7.30 from just west of the... Remember, uh, Dr. Preston Williams Elementary School. So just meet in the parking lot just west of the elementary school at 7.30 uh, a.m. on the next three Saturdays. Um, I think about 10 or 15 people have joined along the first couple walks and seems like about 30 to 40 species of birds have been seen on both walks. Um, but more species will be likely to be seen in the coming weeks since we finally have favorable winds for migration starting tonight. Um, also our Sunday morning bird walks uh, are also continuing throughout the month. Um, these are mostly being led by Zach Sutton, and they've been very well attended. For example, um, I know Zach told me there was 35 people in the last Sunday's walk, so um, these have been um, very well attended throughout the fall and hoping that people continue to come. So um, just a couple events coming up there. And then also a quick change. I know I've posted about it a couple of times, um, but we changed our timing for the mini grants. We also upped them to uh, $500. Um, we're not doing them in the spring anymore. We're not accepting applications in the spring anymore. We're transitioning to this early fall timing. In the future, will be a little earlier, but for the moment, we'll be doing it in the fall. Um, so those are a couple of things coming up. I also want to highlight a couple of our board members really quick. Um, recently, um, Roger Diggs, our vice president, uh, authored a book about Meadowbrook, which is called Meadowbrook uh, History. Um, this can be, uh, if you just search it online, it'll be the first, when you search the title up, um, there's actually a whole website for it. You can go through it directly, uh, purchase it directly through the website or at Adida Purvis Nature Center or eventually on Amazon here soon, based off what I've seen. But there's more information on the website after you search Roger's title. So congrats, Roger, on that big achievement. And then also, once again to Zach, um, Zach's been doing a lot of great things this fall and between leading bird walks and other things, but also last week, uh, if you view on our website, it's also on there at the moment. I'll be posting it on Facebook tomorrow, but he also led a group of Urbana um, high school students on a bird walk around Carl Park. So um, Zach's been doing plenty of great things as always. So thank you, Zach, and congrats, Roger. So those are the two main things that are a few main things that I wanted to highlight for tonight. Um, we'll also be doing, or we'll be going back hopefully in person starting in November, um, for our monthly programs, the, um, November monthly program will be Michael Ward talking about whippoorwills and their decline. And then also that will be back in person. Like we used to be pre COVID at the Urbana free library, same time, um, 7 PM on the first Thursday of November. So look forward to that as well. And information of that coming on our website and our Facebook coming up in the near future. Anyways, I want to give it off to Dr. Henry Pollard. I'll give a very brief overview. Um, Dr. Pollard grew up around C uh, the Champaign-Urbana area, as many of you guys know. Um, and after attending WashU, he has focused most of his graduate and postdoc research around or focused around University of Illinois. Um, he recently moved to Colorado for an executive director position with the Southern Plains Land Trust. And tonight he'll be discussing results from the Urbana Bird Project that him, Zach, and I all worked on during 2022. Um, this will be about 10 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open up to a discussion once we're done. Not sure how exactly that will happen, but we'll figure it out, figure it out as we um, come across that. So anyways, I'll give it off to Dr. Pollock and um, keep your questions to the end. And thank you for joining us tonight. All righty. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see a lot of you out there again. I see a lot of my old uh, my old uni contingent, uh, pa uh, friend, parents, friends. I see uh, my PhD advisor, Jeff Braun. have to give a shout out to Jeff in the audience. Uh, he, he definitely helped me in my uh, ornithological journey. Even my mom is here. So I thank all of you for joining tonight. And um, as Colin mentioned, I am just starting a new job. I'm looking out my window right now at Short Grass Prairie, beautiful habitat in the middle of a nature preserve in southeastern Colorado. 
So I think it's an apropos way to uh, start this talk about Weaver Park, uh, which is a remnant prairie in Urbana, Illinois. So tonight, uh, it's going to be very short. It'll probably be about a 10 to 15 minute talk, as Colin mentioned. And then hopefully it spurs some discussion. We can chat afterwards about how people feel about the situation, um, you know, about things you can do if you if you um, you know want to try to preserve Weaver, et cetera. So um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, I see Derek in the audience, Derek Lieber, uh, Matt, some, Matt Bach, some people from the Urbana Park District. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, the parks in Urbana, um, and they are phenomenal parks, and a lot of that is due to to those people. So I want to want to give a shout out to you as well. Um, lastly, and probably most importantly, I should I should acknowledge Zach Sutton, um, who is obviously on the Champaign County Audubon Society board. Um, Zach is basically responsible for all of this talk, and I'm just kind of parroting a lot of the data that he collated uh, with regard to Weaver Park. So thank you, Zach, for uh, for uh, letting me use these data that you put together. So I want to start with um, you know sort of a rhetorical question, or if anyone wants to answer, feel free. But how do you define park? Um, and when I think about this, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, particularly in the context of Weaver. Um, and, and when I think about this, it brings me back to uh, the old spelling bee days. So for those who didn't know, when I was a kid, I was in the National Spelling Bee. That's my dad, Michael Pollock. Many of you probably knew him. Um, and, uh, you know, I always think about, uh, you know, the definition of a word. That was one of the key elements of, uh, of, of knowing how to spell the word. So when you think about park, if you look up park in Merriam-Webster, which is sort of the, uh, the, the classic dictionary, you see at least seven definitions. Um, and these are just a few of them. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but you see that a lot of this has to do with uh, with nature. So uh, lawns, woodland and pasture, um, maintaining an area in its natural state. Uh, it also has to do with stuff like recreation. So ball games, um, specific types of use, um, ornaments and recreation, et cetera. So these are just a few definitions of how people uh, think of, of a park. And when I searched for park on Google um, in the first 10 images, these three different images came up. So you have, you know, typical recreation park, kids playgrounds, you have these kind of mixed use parks, and then you have these natural areas as well. Um, and all of these serve different purposes and they're all really important for, uh, you know, kind of creating a park system in, in local communities. Um, so to sum up, you know, people have different ideas of what a park is, um, and all of those are valid and all of them are important. Um, but le let's continue and kind of talk about the parks in Champaign-Urbana. So uh, one important thing to notice is that the way that people approach parks and the way they define parks um, in general is going to influence how those parks are managed. So I think a great example is if you take the two cities of Champaign and Urbana. Um, as we know, Champaign and Urbana are part of the same larger conurbation they've grown together over time they're geographically in the exact same region same climate etc so you might expect that uh, these park there are these cities would have very similar bird communities but what we actually find is that there are quite large differences between the champagne and urbana bird community and a lot of this has to do with the way that their parks are managed so if you take the urbana park district um, urbana park district has around 20 parks um, and if you look at the mission of the Urbana Park District, their mission is to pursue excellence in a variety of programs, parks and special facilities that contribute to the attractiveness of neighborhoods, conservation of the environment, overall health of the community. So key in that mission statement is the conservation of the environment. And that is something that Urbana has done an amazing job with. Um, as many of us know, probably go to Meadowbrook, other parks around town, probably Weaver. Um, you know that there are some signature natural areas that are really important for biodiversity of all kinds, plant biodiversity, but also bird biodiversity as well. These are just a few of those sites, which you're probably all familiar with. Um, now, Champaign has a different approach to parks. So Champaign has a lot more parks. Um, many of those parks are somewhat smaller and they have slightly different mission. So the mission of the Champaign Park District is to enhance the community's quality of life, through positive experiences in parks, recreation, and cultural arts. So when you kind of put these two definitions side by side, you can see that um, Champaign focuses a bit more on recreation um, and these sort of cultural arts aspects. And again, all of these things are really important in building a strong network of parks in a community. Um, they also have some signature natural areas, but as we'll see here in a minute, um, there, are, there are big differences between the bird communities in these two different uh, cities due to the way that their parks, uh, park districts approach management of these parks. So again, different missions, different bird communities. Um, so what this is from, and on the right there, you'll see a photo of Colin Dobson and Zach Sutton. 
This was actually taken in uh, Puerto, actually Dominican Republic, I believe. We went uh, birding there about a year ago, had a great trip together. But these guys are the reason for this data set. Um, they're both far better birders than I am. And uh, at my previous postdoc at the University of Illinois was focused on trying to, um, in a standardized way, characterize the bird community in the two cities of Champaign and Urbana. So that's what you see here on the left. This is just some sort of uh, a sort of map of the two different cities. And you can see we were looking at a couple different areas, but we were particularly comparing public parks with uh, private residential locations. And we were comparing across the cities and also across seasons. So I'm just going to present a little data kind of showing the differences, the, the gross differences in Champaign and Urbana's bird communities. And that's what we're looking at here. So Champaign is on the left and Urbana is on the right. And you can see this typical seasonal pattern whereby in the summer, the bird community is more diverse. You have more species around compared to the winter. It's pretty much a no brainer. But you'll also notice and you can see those letters on the top of the graph that indicate uh, how, how these uh, sort of groups are different that there are big differences between Champaign and Urbana. So both in both summer and winter, Urbana's uh, bird community is, is more diverse. Um, and that is just across the board. There's, there's no bones about it. And a lot of that has to do, again, with the way that the parks are managed. Um, this is sort of uh, a couple of different uh, infographics that we created from this research project for which um, Colin, Zach, and I collected these data around Champaign-Urbana. And you can see Champaign in the left. So we sampled 14 parks in Champaign in the winter and summer of 2022. This was over 140 bird surveys. Um, we just recorded everything that we saw and heard. And um, so it's sort of a snapshot. It's not a, a comprehensive uh, picture of the bird diversity in each community, but it's a snapshot and it, it's, a, it's a good proxy. And what you'll see here is when you look at Champaign, you do see that there are some diverse parks in Champaign, particularly places like Heritage Park, Robeson Park, places that have water and some remnant prairie. Um, but if you compare Champaign and Urbana side by side, again, you will see that those signature parks in Urbana Meadowbrook, Crystal Lake, and Weaver um, are just far outperforming all the parks in Champaign. And, and, and this sort of natural area that Urbana has is, is um, in, incredibly important to uh, creating such a diverse bird community in, in, a, in a city. And in particular, you notice here, and this is the subject of the talk, Weaver Park. So Weaver Park is right up there with Meadowbrook and Crystal Lake. Um, I think one of the things about Weaver is that it's, it's it's a bit less known compared to these other parks. So I think that Meadowbrook and Crystal Lake tend to be more recognized by the local community. Um, we've done surveys of the local community and found that those are kind of the two prime areas that people go for recreation and for outdoor activities and for connecting with nature. But what you see is that Weaver Park is right up there with these other two. So um, it's sort of punching above its weight. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But first of all, I'd like to give a bit of Weaver Park history. Um, and if I am butchering this, uh, I may I might be uh, getting this a bit off. So Derek can can send a note in the chat and correct me. But um, I, I um, have been having some chats with Derek and, and Tim Bartlett, who is the executive director of the Park District. And they, they've given me a bit of information about the sort of history of Weaver Park. So Weaver Park is located in East Urbana. It's currently about 60 acres. And this is some imagery that you see here on the right of the park. So you can see that there is um, a nice stand of forest in the in the um, th this sort of uh, quadrant of the park, the northwestern, uh, the, sorry, the northeastern quadrant of the park. Um, some of the trees in there are still remnant from the old big grove that used to connect all the way from Treeleaf Woods over in East Urbana to uh, Busey Woods. Um, you can also see that there's some really good prairie habitat here. So the vast majority of Weber Park is this kind of restored prairie habitat. And then in the southeast corner, you have uh, this wetland here. So it's kind of these three different habitats. Um, when I mentioned that Weber kind of punches above its weight, part of the reason I was mentioning that is because Weaver is much smaller than these other two parks, Crystal Lake and Meadowbrook, which are sort of more known for their natural area, uh, as for their, you know, cachet as natural areas. Uh, Weaver is less than half the size of both of those parks. But if you recall from the previous slide, the bird diversity is almost identical between Weaver and these two much larger parks. So it shows you just how important Weaver is for the bird community in Urbana. Um, there, again, there are three main habitats, the prairie, the forest, and the wetland. Um, they're all really nice and they, they contribute to part of that part of the reason why um, you have this sort of mosaic of habitats is why Weaver has such high bird diversity. Originally, Weaver was acquired by the Urbana Park District in 2002 and the original plan for Weaver called for a combination of natural areas, athletic fields and trails to support mixed use. So this was, um, you know, an important part of the history um, and it will it will give some context for what I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, the uh, there were drainage issues that seemed to impede the original plan. Um, so the Urbana Park District, and I want to give a particular shout out again to Derek Liebert, who is the superintendent of the Park District, reseeded Weaver Park with native prairie plants and Forbes. Um, he led that effort. 
and they created something incredibly special. Um, as you can see by just the sheer diversity of birds in Weaver Park, it is one of the most special areas around town. And I'm going to get here a little bit into the into the specifics of why Weaver is so special and which species you can see that are quite rare in the general area in the general region um, that you can find at Weaver. So um, this is uh, all put together by Zach Sutton, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, basically what this is, is sort of a, a brief summary. This is by no means exhaustive, but it's a brief summary of why weaver is so important uh, for birds in Champaign County. So we're gonna go through a few species. Um, and in particular um, for migratory birds, weaver is an important stopover site. So in a larger matrix of agriculture, as we all know, much of the prairie habitat in Illinois has been destroyed. There's less than 1% of the native prairie left in the state of Illinois. Um, these small remnant patches of prairie are really important, especially for migratory birds like sparrows. So one great example is Nelson Sparrow. Um, in the past 10 years, there have been greater than 30 sightings of Nelson Sparrow at Weaver. Um, and in the entirety of Champaign County, they've only been, this species has only been found at four other locations. And in most of those locations, it's only one to three sightings per location, um, which is obviously much smaller than 30 sightings. So a great example of a migratory sparrow that depends on this remnant grassland slash prairie habitat to, um, you know, to make their journey south for the winter. Um, additionally, Lacan sparrow is another species that's had more than 30 sightings at Weaver in the past 10 years. And they have been found at about 12 other locations in Champaign County. But again, all of those locations are only about one to three sightings. So just cannot compare to Weaver. It's just head and shoulders above the rest in terms of its ability to support these migratory sparrows. Uh, we have several different species of water birds. So I mentioned that Weaver Park has a chunk of wetland. That wetland is one of the best areas in town to see water birds. It may seem small, but it, it is, again, punching above its weight and its ability to um, support water birds. So American bittern is another great example. Um, Weaver Park is the only location in the county with multiple sightings in multiple years of American bittern. So there have been a couple scattered sightings throughout the rest of the county in East Central Illinois. But again, this is the premier place for American bittern. Again, this might get a little bit uh, repetitive because the story is the same for all of these species. Sora is a species of rail. Um, this is actually not, not, not a super rare bird, but they definitely are declining. And again, Weaver is the top location in all of Champaign County to see this rare, or the, this um, this uh, rail water bird. Marsh wren, same thing. Weaver is the top location in the county to see marsh wren. And then finally, Virginia rail, um, which is a species that has been found at several other places, but Weaver is a top three location in the county. So these are a few examples, and there's a host more. Um, another, another list of species that have been found only a few times, but almost exclusively at Weaver includes species like the least bittern, the yellow rail, um, the cattle egret. Um, so these are all water dependent species. Uh, the eastern whippoorwill, the Amer uh, the grasshopper sparrow, the lark sparrow, and the bob bobolink. So these are all uh, grassland species. So again, um, just sort of a snapshot of the types of birds that you'll find at Weaver. But again, Weaver is is just unparalleled in its ability to support uh, these bird species, even even in comparison with places like Meadowbrook, which is also a restored prairie. So I quickly want to get into um, the proposed plans for Weaver Park. So. Uh, in the last uh, few months, there have been uh, the Abandoned Park District has held some meetings and they've uh, kind of come up with a couple different proposals for what they want to do with Weaver Park. And these proposals, again, hark back to the original um, sort of history of Weaver. So Weaver was originally intended to be a mixed use area that included uh, ball fields and other recreation areas. Um, and it, it's important to mention that, uh, you know, that the Urbana Park District is facing some challenges because the, the ball fields, they usually rent from the county. Um, they're not sure if they're gonna be able to lease them anymore. So this is a complicated situation. Um, I just want people to come away from this sort of having a better picture of what the situation is at Weaver, why it's important, and also, you know, how we can kind of work with the park district to find the best plan that um, that is kind of in line with what, what the community wants. Um, so I, I don't I don't want this to generate any negative uh, uh, energy against the park district. Again, as I mentioned, Urbana is, is doing an amazing job with their natural areas. Um, and Weaver Park is a crowning achievement, which shows just how successful the Urbana Park District has been um, in their stewardship of natural areas. So um, the first plan, as you can see here, involves these sort of ball fields. So they're going to put in a lot of courts, uh, both baseball and then um, also tennis courts and a soccer field. And then the second plan is somewhat similar, but both of these plans involve substantial encroachment into the, um, the sort of uh, remnant natural area, and particularly the prairie on the western side of Weaver. Um, 
So the Urbana Park District, to their credit, um, came out. They had a community forum. Um, and there were a lot of people in the community, including myself, who said, hey, wait a minute, you know, let's stop and let's have a conversation about this. Um, and Because obviously people are worried about what this is going to mean for not only the bird community, but just for prairie and grassland nature in general. Again, I'm talking only about birds in this talk, but the, the same thing probably goes for insects, plants, and a variety of other species as well. Um, so both of these plans involve a substantial encroachment into Weaver. And so the Urbana Park District um, got feedback from the local community. Um, and and they have been doing a great job of trying to take uh, that feedback and, and people's opinions into account. So they formed a steering committee to try to understand what's going to happen with Weaver and Prairie Park. Um, and and I, at the end of this talk, I'm basically going to give you, um, you know, some recommendations on ways that you can help and the ways that you can interact with the park district to try to, um, you know, make your voice heard if, if you believe that Weaver is an important area and you want it to, to be preserved, or at the very least, if you want, uh, if you want it to remain an important, uh, you know, bird area while while still, you know, doing a bit of development. So, I think that uh, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, the first thing I would suggest is just to write the Urbana Park District board members. So there's a board of commissioners, Roger, who is who is a huge uh, influence in the Champaign County of Audubon Society is part of that. So feel free to talk to Roger and other commissioners, and just have some dialogue with them and talk to them about you know what the plans are and and you know how you can maybe get involved. Um, additionally, you you can attend the Urbana Park District board meetings. So you can go and you can kind of express your views, whatever those may be. Um, you can contact the UPD staff and the two people that I. I've been chatting with a lot who are, who are um, doing a great job of kind of organizing the steering committee are Tim Bartlett, who is the executive director of the UPD, and Derek Liebert, who is the superintendent of parks. So I encourage you to reach out to them. And, you know, they they are incredibly, um, you know, they've done an incredibly good job of taking the feedback from the community into account and kind of pumping the brakes in situations so that we can have more input to make a more informed decision about what should happen with Weaver Park. And then lastly, um, you know, if you're interested in trying to support this, there is a change.org petition. Um, so you can go there and you can sign that if you feel that, um, you know, you want to preserve this area and, and the birds of this area. So those are a few just examples, concrete examples of how you can get involved to help. Um, and with that, uh, oh, yeah. And then also you can contact Kayla Meyer. So Kayla has been kind of getting people together who, um, you know, who are interested in birds and other uh, flora and fauna at Weber Park. So you can feel free to contact her. And she's been doing some coordinating with people um, in the community. So with that, um, I will leave you uh, with any questions that you may have, and uh, I hope this can maybe start a discussion about, you know, how people feel about Weber Park, and, and yeah, I'm just curious to hear how people feel about it. So thank you again for listening. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Henry. Um, maybe once we're starting here, just raise your hand if you have an initial question for Henry, and then we'll maybe go from there. So we'll figure out our best way to do this. But if you have a question for Henry first, just... Um, if you can raise your hand or even just unmute, unmute yourself to ask Henry a question. Henry, I've got a question. Uh, I reside in Champaign. Sure. And would that have any influence on the Urbana Park District? I think it depends on, you know, whether you choose to recreate in those areas. So, you know, Champaign-Urbana are, are, you know, they do have different bird communities, but they are right next to each other. And I think that, um, you know, if if you spend time in Weaver Park, or maybe if you don't, uh, if you don't spend time in Weaver Park, go check it out and, and you know, see, see what you think of it. But um, as I mentioned in the talk, I think it, it, it is really a, a special thing that has been created by the Urbana Park District um and and particularly for birds so i encourage everybody and 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 i just want to you know give a shout out to zach especially um zach has you know uh agreed to lead multiple bird walks he's already led several of those to weaver park just to kind of highlight that this is sort of an overlooked but really premier natural area in in the champaign urbana community thank you there is one question in the chat carlson asks if the prairie were reduced to half its size as the current plans propose, what would the likely impact of the Weaver, Weaver Park natural communities be? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think the the to be perfectly honest with you, and it might not be a satisfactory answer, but I, I don't think we really know. And I think that is um, where a lot of the sort of uncertainty has been generated in the situation. I think that um, there was a lot of concern expressed by people who were in the original um, sort of community forum about the proposed plans for Weber Park. 
because uh, the, you know, it, it is the proposed plan will, uh, you know, remove half of that prairie area, especially from the western kind of part, side of the park, leaving about 30 acres left. Um, so it's still a nice chunk of habitat. Um, it still leaves the wetland. I think everybody is cognizant that the wetland especially is a really important piece of habitat. But I think the the, the answer to that question is we don't really know. I think that's sort of an empirical question, um, and it depends on on a variety of things. It depends, you know, that it, it could be um, a kind of situation when you know if you if you end up cutting the habitat down, we don't know if that's going to mean that what is left is not going to be big enough to attract birds. Maybe it will be, maybe it won't. Um, you know, we really don't know. And I also think that that you know, I I would say it's also important to maybe even get more baseline data on other taxa like plants and insects to try to see what Weber is doing for those um, those different taxonomic groups as well. So I, I will say that um, you know, this is something that we are that I I as, with many other people are an active. Um, uh, talks with the park district about. Um, as I mentioned, Derek Liebert is, uh, has kind of uh, chaired the steering committee and Tim Bartlett. Um, and they're doing a great job of trying to uh, get people from different, you know, backgrounds together, people who are interested in recreation, people like myself who are ecologists, um, and just try to get some data together from, you know, the, the published literature or, or wherever we can to try to understand what the impacts would be, um, and then to try to act accordingly. So, so I, I do want to commend the Park District for, again, for their, um, their willingness to kind of, you know, pump the brakes on this and, and take in more information before making a more informed decision. But the short answer is I, I do not know what kind of impact that would have. So, yeah. Thank you, Carlson, for the question. Um, but yeah, if you have any other questions at the moment, um, feel free to unmute yourself or comment or raise your hand one or the other, and we'll go from there. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey. The, the, this was a plan way back in 2002. Why does it still have to be the plan right now? Things must have changed. There must be other parks, more other uh, areas for football fields and uh, baseball things. Why does it still have to be the plan now? That's a really good question. And I think that is what we're trying to suss out with the park district. So I think that I do think it would be important to, you know, look into alternative places where we maybe could put these fields um, that wouldn't necessarily encroach on this habitat. Or if we do have to put fields in the area, you know, try to minimize the encroachment as much as possible. Um, I do think that it's important in, in this day and age. And, you know, I don't I don't know if anyone's been looking at the, the like some recent climate reports that have been happening, but this year is just insane climate wise in terms of temperature it's just very scary um and you know there 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 there's bizarre climate things happening all over the earth the amazon has gone through a crazy drought you know you name it um everywhere we're we're already experiencing the impacts of climate change um so i do think that you know it's important to consider um i think we have to try to take a long term view of the situation right um you know, even this summer in, in Urbana, there were soccer games, children's soccer games that were canceled because of heat advisories. So, you know, in terms of building these outdoor places, you know, in open areas with no shade, I think it's important to consider, you know, what the long term viability of those fields would be. And, and I also think it's important to consider, you know, the fact that, um, you know, grasslands provide and prairies provide a, a variety of ecosystem services. So things like carbon storage, um, you know, habitat for a variety of different species, such as birds, uh, the list goes on, you know, climate resiliency. Um, there's a lot of tangible benefits that are provided by these natural areas, even if they are remnant natural areas. And I think it's important to try to get a holistic view of all this before we move forward and, and you know, and and do delve into this area that that is so important for birds and other, and I believe other tax as well. So I think that's a great question, Jesse. And um, I think it's, it's, it's part of the reason why the steering committee has been formed. Hi, this is Peggy. Hi, Henry. Thank you so much for sharing Hi. your good work. We really appreciate you and Zach and and uh, and the others who contributed. Um, I wonder if you know how what impact just human traffic has on the amount of bird species. I mean, what was so striking was that you know Weaver Park, which is half the size of Crystal Lake and Meadowbrook, has nearly the same number of species. And I and I wonder if that has something to do with you know it has so much less human traffic. So almost regardless of how, how much acreage might get taken out for soccer fields, would just the introduction of a lot of human traffic seriously reduce mm -hmm. the bird species in Weaver Park? 
That's a great question. And I think that, you know, again, I, I don't know if I have the answer to that. By the way, it's great to see you. Um, tell Hannah I said hi. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think that um, I think part of the reason why Weber is really special is because it is a mosaic of different habitats. So I think that does increase the biodiversity. You have the forest part, you have the prairie part and you have the wetland. Um, and so I think that, that that is part of the reason that makes it so special is it has these different types of habitats. Um, I do, I do think that especially for secretive water birds, um, you know, that, that human, human activity can, you know, influence whether or not they stick around a place. And, you know, if there's a bunch of people crowding around, then it's not going to be, um, you know, maybe as optimal habitat. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that again, this is not, um, this is not a simple uh, answer to this question. And I think that's something that should also be looked at, um, you know, because I think that if we, you know, if, if, if Weaver ends up becoming as heavily trafficked as places like Meadowbrook or, or Busey, you know, may, maybe it could have a negative impact on the, on the, you know, the plant and animal community. So that's a great question. Yeah, not sure. Thank you. Any more questions? Those have been great so far. I'm just going to comment. I mean, this development will be a disaster from the point of view of the birds, as far as I'm, that's my opinion, a disaster. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Jesse. I think that, um, you know, I think that uh, move, trying to get some, you know, parameters for how this might actually work, you know, looking at the published literature, seeing what other studies have showed, I, I, you know, I often approach these questions from an empirical point of view. So I like to see data and I like to see, you know, what what has been found in other places. Um, I, I think I think it, it's part of the challenge of the situation is that we really don't know how this kind of development will impact the park. Um, I, I personally tend to agree with you. I think that it will definitely negatively impact the bird community it will probably reduce diversity and especially some of these rare species that that come through during migration um so yeah i mean i think that you know i think that um that it, that's my go ahead it, it's it's far too small an area to sustain that kind of development yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's totally possible. So I think, again, I think that, um, you know, hopefully, you know, you can you can reach out to the park district and express those opinions and let them know how you feel and, and you know, get involved. I think that, you know, we have to in, the, in this situation, I think it is challenging because I think we have to understand that, you know, first of all, this was a restored prairie. This did not originally exist. The park district has created an amazing habitat. I personally think it would be it would be sad if it was you know if it was split in half for for development um, especially over the long term. Um, so I would just encourage you to reach out to the park district and express your views and um, and you know they're they're going to do their best to try to you know integrate all of these kind of conflicting views in the community and make a decision that that benefits the residents on a whole. So perfect. I see that Kirk has his hand raised, so I'll leave it off to Kirk. Yeah, I don't know if you, hopefully I'm, I'm coming through here. Uh, Henry, nice job uh, in, in the talk and nice job talking about the, this or bringing up the nuances associated with this. Um, but I, I do want kind of addressing the last question to um, kind of make the point that we're really talking more about it, like birding opportunities than the, the species themselves. Like this, the Weaver Park has really no impact on Nelson's sparrows populations. Like it's, we're not going to see a, a decline in that population or any population of species that go through there. So we're really talking about sort of the opportunities to bird and not necessarily the species themselves. I think that's a, an important thing to sort of remember in this in this case. Yeah, so I I agree with Kirk. I think that you know when when an when you when you find an animal in a particular habitat, it may not necessarily mean that the animal is, you know, like, you know, they're not maybe not breeding in the habitat, then maybe, you know, their population may not be doing well in the habitat. They could be there and it could be a sort of ecological trap. So it it, it, it is not a, a, as simple as, and maybe I didn't mean to portray it as that, but that's a good point. Um, but I do think that, you know, on a broader scale, you know, if you, if you see these sort of remnant areas winking out in a largely agricultural landscape in Illinois, I, I do think that that will have an effect. You know, you think about what happened at Bell Bowl Prairie, which is one of the best, um, you know, kind of remnants of ancient prairie in northern Illinois that was just destroyed for an airport earlier this year. Um, you know, we're, we're really losing these habitats, um, you know, even the small amount that are left at, at a rapid rate. And so I think that um, it's important to consider in that context as well, although I will acknowledge that, you know, it's not it's not demography, it's not nuts and bolts population, um, you know, data. So I, I agree with you. But uh, I do I do think that there is something to say for 
also the, you know, people going to these natural areas and getting to see some of these rare birds and, you know, that, that who knows whether that could be a spark for a kid to, you know, become a birder or, you know, become, you know, invest in environmental stewardship. So I do think that beyond the, you know, the, the hard science, I think there are also social, you know, ecological benefits as well. Go ahead, Zach. All right. Can you all hear me? Uh, I also want to just uh, thank you, Kirk, for that that comment. You know, that's absolutely right that it, you know, we're saying that if this is gone, it doesn't mean that the Nelson Sparrows population is going to disappear or whatever. Uh, but it does mean, you know, with uh, the Urbana Park District's, um, you know, their mission statement of, you know, preserving natural areas, giving people uh, in the community a chance to experience that. Uh, you know, if Weaver goes away, then I think, anybody having a, a decent chance of seeing these amazing birds in Champaign County, or at least in Champaign-Urbana itself, uh, goes away with it. So yes, the birds themselves, you know, certain individuals might get impacted by not having their stopover point uh, that they might have been banking on. Um, but yeah, we, we the, the birders, are the ones that are really going to miss out. Uh, and, and I think that's one reason why, although it is also good for the birds to have a, a wonderful large area to, you know, to to stop over on their migration. Uh, it's also really, really good, as Henry was mentioning, uh, for, for us to get a chance to, you know, experience those birds. And, and I, I remember when I was at Weaver and I, uh, a much more experienced birder when I was, I would only been birding for maybe three or four years. Uh, and he was like, hey, I just found a Nelson Sparrow. You want to see it? I mean, that literally happened for me at Weaver Park. And, and he showed me, uh, you know, where to look for it. And I hung around in the middle of this marsh and it would grass up to my chin, basically, uh, for about 10 minutes, it popped up and I got like a a five second look at this bird and my mind was just blown. I was like, I didn't know a sparrow could look that beautiful. Uh, you know, so I do appreciate your comment there, but I also want to make sure it's also understood that like, th that's, that's kind of the whole point is that this is for us, the members of the community uh, to, to have our, our outlet in, into, uh, into nature, into the, into the wild part of the world. And, you know, have those moments uh, where I don't have to drive two hours to go get, you know, an experience like that. Uh, I can literally on my way to pick up my kid after school, I can I can stop for 15 minutes and maybe have that experience. Uh, and that, that's also a really unique and special thing about Weaver. Not only the bird diversity, uh, not over not not also the, the three different types of habitat there, but just the location, you know, the fact that it is just literally in people's backyards uh, in our area uh, is, is makes it so special, uh, which is why I, I'm hoping that more people can experience it, see how great it is, and share their share their opinions with the park district so that the park district can make sure that if there's enough people that are, are you know, I would say desperate for those experiences and that possibility, uh, that that voice can really be heard and uh, taken into account as decisions are made with Weaver. Just a side note, um, I also saw my first Nelson Sparrow ever at Weaver, and it was Zach who showed it to me. And ever since then, Weber has been one of my favorite parks in Urbana because it's like the place to go for sparrows during migration. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely share that sentiment. Hi, hi, Henry and Zach. I was wondering, are there any wetland birds that have nested successfully there? Do you know? And also, is the um, has the American bittern? Does that has that nested? And that's a state endangered bird, right? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure about nesting. Zach would know better than I, than than I. I I don't think any of those birds have been documented nesting there. Colin, are you aware of any of them? No, as far as I know, no. And in terms of nesting, those species like more larger marshes than that, and also we're on the southern extent of most of those um, marsh. Like for example, American bittern only nests at a couple places in in northern Illinois. So do so do the rails. So, I mean, um, we're also right on the edge of those breeding ranges of some of those birds. So that also makes it harder for them to nest at a wetland like that. So no, but thank you for the question. Go ahead, Clark. Okay. I I just wanted to make a comment on, uh, build on a comment I heard a few minutes ago about, it's been what, 20 years 
since the first master plan. And I think people are thinking a little differently now than they were then. Um, and maybe planners, the typical planner's vision in the old days was multiple use and sustained yield ever since the Forest Service got started. And many tracks are just too small to accommodate a diversity of uses. And I think that's where a lot of planners start. We've got this many acres and we've got all these demands. How do we arrange them and minimize the adverse interactions among them? But I think we ought to take a more distant look and think about the kinds of experiences that people are looking for. If you go to Meadowbrook, yes, the kids can play on the playground while mom and dad walk around the park or something. But um, but even there, there's enough competition <laughs> that um, and interference. And when you think of um, Weaver Park already, we're planning some activities at the south end that are going to require parking lots and lighting. And uh, the more people you design for, the bigger the parking lots have to be. So um, I would try to think of, let's look at it from the whole park district's perspective. Yes, we need soccer fields and yes, we need natural areas. What's the cost of making a new one there just aren't you don't just create 60 acres of natural area overnight it's a long-term commitment and and it uh, but theoretically it's possible to turn a cornfield into a soccer field a little quicker so it's that kind of thinking that i'd like to introduce into the into the conversation that's all. Definitely appreciate that perspective, Clark. Mm -hmm. Yes, I totally agree. Here, 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 here. Okay. Um, any more questions? Um, I guess we. I mean, we can just. I mean, if people would just like to bring up their comments or their thoughts, I mean, we, we can just open up to that as well. Um, not entirely sure um, what people would like to discuss or what to talk about. It seems like we've kind of opened to that already, but um, if other people would like to share your, share their comments, share their questions to us um, or other things, just feel free to do so right now. So, um, but yeah, you can raise your hand like others have been doing. You can just go ahead and start whatever you feel comfortable with. But also just for FYI, I'm still recording this for the moment. Um, just so um, to get other people's perspectives on things and other things. So yeah, just raise your hand or unmute yourself whenever you're ready. I'll just say one thing really quickly. If anyone is interested um, in that last slide and like, you know, just who to contact and if you, if you want to, you know, chat with people about it, um, you can email me. It's in the chat at henry.s.pollock at gmail.com or you can email Colin and I'll pass a copy of my PowerPoint on to Colin so you have those links. Yeah, just, just email or Audubon email and I'll for them too, if you would like them. So, go ahead, Kirk. Yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm coming at this from literally 30 years of doing this stuff, and I just want to provide a little devil's advocate, though. Is that like our desires as a birding community? we are a, a part of the community and there's larger parts of the community that may not be as vociferous as some of us have the ability to be. And I think we need to be sort of cognizant of that, that there are other members of the community that might benefit from other aspects and don't necessarily have the ability to be as loud as we can be on this issue. Um, and that's, that's one thing that I see in this community that sort of makes me upset at times. For but, sure. And I, I think that, uh, so, sorry, Kirk, I was going to say, I, I, I see, you know, where you're coming from 100%. And I think that, um, you know, I think that, that it, it's, it's really easy to, you know, to point fingers and say, you know, 
hey, you know, the park district is destroying this habitat. Um, but I think I think it's a more complex situation than that I th I do. I think that, you know, the park district or uh, like, first of all, if you compare abandoned champagne, there are clear differences in the management approach and in how that impacts the birds for one. Um, I, and I think that Urban is doing an amazing job with their natural areas. I think that you have to consider that there's a place like the Perkins Road site. So that's a site that the Park District, Urban and Park District has been working on for a long time. It's like hopefully will soon be like fully open to the public. Um, it's a, it's going to be another premier natural area. Um, and so, you know, it's not like there's no mitigation going on. Um, you know, I think that also there's a lot of people in the community like Kirk is saying who, who need, you know, who need those recreation opportunities. Um, so all I would just say is, you know, if you feel strongly about it, contact the steering committee, contact the people at the park district um, and just make your voice heard. And I think that, I think that in a truly democratic process, you know, in the end, what you're going to have is you're going to have a bunch of people who are expressing their opinions. And then hopefully, you know, that will that will will lead the way to some sort of consensus or at least some sort of compromise that can that can try to um, that can try to satisfy, you know, these sort of um, groups who are coming at this from different perspectives. But also, I think some people just don't have had have not had the opportunity to bird or spend time in nature. I've been a part of volunteering with um, bringing the uh, Dr. Williams kits to the wetland, prairie, and forest. And some of those kids, it's the first time that they can look at aquatic invertebrates or see a frog or see some ducks on the water. And they're they're thrilled and they haven't had that opportunity. And here we have a school, like so many schools, they have to bus their kids to, uh, to some a place like that, but here it's adjacent. And so this is another opportunity for the next generation to also, you know, to become more cognizant of, of ecology and its importance and what it can do for them. It's not just about ecology, it's about what it can do for, for ourselves as well. Both both points are very, very valid. I also just since Henry um just mentioned that, I mean, I know I know Derek and I walked out at least a couple of times at Perkins Road over the last two or three years. What do you know, Henry, or anyone else know the current plans on Perkins for the future? I didn't really know where that was going for the future. Um, I mean, I knew over time there were going to be more and more practices and management strategies on it, but I don't know what the longevity plan was for Perkins, since that's somewhat of a similar type of habitat with the variance within the woodlands, and there's definitely some shrublands and some prairies there, and then there's also the one or two kind of impoundment type wetlands. I didn't really know where that stood. Yeah, maybe if Derek is still here, maybe he could answer, um, you know, and Derek, Derek is a superintendent of parks and he's kind of, you know, the one, he's kind of the one who's, you know, involved at the top levels and all this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I am driving right now, so I, I probably shouldn't talk too much, but uh, I can let you know that this year, one of our goals is to do a, an assessment of what would be required to open that site. Uh, we completed the final phases of restoration and uh, have begun putting in some early trails. Uh, we'll be working with an ADA consultant to evaluate the, the best way to provide access to that site. In addition to the, the wetlands and the prairie and the woodland, it, it's got actually some pretty wonderful topography, which uh, presents uh, both some, some neat opportunities, but also some challenges in terms of how, how we want to have folks access the site. Uh, at this point, we've been anticipating we're probably, you know, I, I would guess two, two to three years off before we'd be ready to open the site, but that, that'll be better informed by, by this year's work we'll be doing with our ADA accessibility consultant. Uh, Derek, do we own that site? No, Roger, we do not. That, that's a, a leased site from the, the, the San Terry district. Um, they've been great partners in that work. Uh, you know, the, the restoration work we've been doing there has been largely funded by their support as well as some, uh, some uh, conservation uh, grant dollars from the Department of Natural Resources. Mm. That's a really good point. Okay. Yeah, I did not know the... Um... The specifics of that project or the property and i just know that it's somewhat similar but i don't know all the specifics behind it so thank you for um clearing up on that derek um any other questions or comments i mean i'm not i'm not gonna plan i mean probably after about 8 or 8 15 i'll probably close the meeting but just this is just time for other people to share their comments like you guys have been doing so well are there any other questions for any of us here so um, 
just keep doing it for the moment. We've never really had a meeting like this, so, um, but just figured it was a good time to have it. So I'm just. Colin, I just want to say one more thing and just that I appreciate uh, all the work that Audubon's doing. I uh, appreciate Henry and Zach and just work in doing uh, uh, some of the, the research and collecting data on bird use in our parks. Uh, and uh, as, as has been mentioned before, we're, we're going to take more time in our planning and our, uh, anticipating that we'll have a good outcome. Thank, thank you for all your work. Yeah, and thank thank you for sure. Um, just want to say thank you for at least um, coming to us um, over the last several months and then also just uh, being open to our thoughts, our ideas, the community's, um, community's thoughts about all this and then also just waiting or pushing back the uh, plan for a little bit um, to get more ideas and thoughts from others in the community. So I just want to say thank you too. And thank you for even coming tonight. So um, thank you as well, Derek. Yeah, I want to thank Derek too. And just the park district in general. I, I think that like we, you know, it's it's easy to point fingers, but I think we have to realize like we have a really good park system in Urbana, like really good, you know, for, and, and we have really good people who are working on it. And we also have people who are willing to listen. So I would just say, if you're passionate about this, um, you know, just talk to them and, and give your input, you know, that's, that's the best that we can do. And hopefully it'll make a difference. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that in a community, you know, there's a lot of communities where that where you wouldn't necessarily have a voice in this. And I think that the the willingness of the park district to engage with the community is, is really important. And I and I really appreciate that. I I would also add that the park district is hearing from people other than the, no, I shouldn't put it that way. They're also hearing from people that are very interested in getting soccer fields in their parents and coaches and kids um, that 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 would like to see that there. So uh, we have to hear those voices as well uh, as we as we make the decision and it's um, going to be difficult. Alan, can I, since we're talking about general things, could you just explain a little bit more about the mini grants for teachers? I know about them, but I, I, I noticed there's several people tonight who are not Audubon members and might not know what those mini grants for educators are. Yes, so those are due in 10 days. Um, so we have given out for decades um, grants to elementary teachers. I mean, I think, I'm trying to remember the last cycle, if there were any non-teachers. I'm sure before there were a few that were non-teachers, but for the most part, they're teachers that ask, um, for grants to do naturist type of things. It doesn't have to be specifically for birds. For example, we gave um, a grant to a teacher wanting to do some bee, um, some bee work with some kids, um, some bee um, informational things with some kids. Um, it could be anything from just, I'm trying to think of some, um, some projects in the future. But anyways, all the information is on our website. Um, it can be from buying bird books and taking kids out. I know there's a very unique one from this last cycle um, that was uh, teaching kids birds and how to look at them and basically how to draw birds and just create bird murals. I mean, it could be like anything from taking kids out to birding or um, little class activities for any nature type of thing. Or I mean, it's a very broad, I mean, like I said, we gave out a grant for some bee research type of stuff before. So I'm um, in, in the last cycle. So it could be anything, um, but yeah, all the information is on our website. It can be just be um, on the grant drop down on our website. They're due on the 15th. So it's just a small application to spill out if you're um, your, basically your personal information, um, a project proposal that you might have, and then a short little um, um funding like what you'd use the money for. And then basically if you would get the grant, you're not required, but definitely recommended to get um, a few pictures of your project in action. And then just a little paragraph summary of what you do. And we've already gotten two or three of the project summaries from the ones that we gave out in May. So um, just a good little opportunity, just for reference, we used to do this in the spring from April to May, give them out in late May or early June, but through our board discussions this summer, we felt like it was best to do it early in the school year so they would have the whole school year to do it versus to have, or give the grants at, at the very beginning of the summer and then not have anything for the whole summer and then get back to school and maybe either forget about them or um, other things with just without. Um, excuse me, I have an informational question. Earlier on, there was something that said there was 
uh, Urbana Park District area out Perkins Road. Now, is that available to people to go on to? Because I vaguely remember in the past going out there for a special trip and we had to have permission to go on to that. Is that still the same situation? That is correct. Um, as far as I know, it's, I mean, maybe Derek can chime in here in a little bit. Uh, it's all gated off and it's all, like, for example, there's a small little entrance road right next to the Urbana Dog Park. Um, and the, this gated off there. And I'm pretty sure the entire um, Perkins Road area is, I mean, the fence is short, but it fenced around it, if I remember correctly. But maybe Derek or someone else would have more information. Colin, you're correct. The, the, the site is uh, still closed for general public access. We have done some public programs out there. Uh, Matt Balk, our notorious coordinator, uh, has volunteers that come out and help the stewards. So if you'd like to participate in some hands-on uh, naturally stewardship, please contact Matt. Um, and then several members of Audubon have keys that are helping us monitor the bird populations out there. I would encourage anybody that wants more information on, on any of this, uh, Weaver Park or, or the, the Perkin site to visit our website. And on the website uh, under planning on projects for Weaver Park, you'll find a link where you can sign up to get more information about the process as it continues. And I uh, just want to echo Roger's comments as well. That, on the steering committee, you know, we will have a representation from a lot of the, the, the community. We'll have folks from uh, the soccer community, the softball community, uh, lots of natural areas folks as well, um, and then also some, some trail folks. Uh, one of the things that uh, the park will support in the future is a connection with the uh, rail trail, and uh, we're, we're excited about that opportunity as well. So please uh, visit our website to get more information and uh, sign up to get that, uh, updates as they're as available. Thank you so much, Derek, for all that. Um, yeah, I will say um, thank you for being very open to the groups, um, just getting everyone's comment on everything um, from versus from the recreational people. Like I know Henry and Zach are going to be very involved with this going forward um, from our bird side. Um, but then it's just it's just great to see everyone come together and try to piece this out from here on. So um, that's good to hear. Hey, hey, Roger, has anyone brought up like I what I afraid what I'm afraid is going to happen is that, you know, athletic fields are going to be put in, but we're going to have they're going to have a lot of weeds, a lot of prairie plants coming up. So I think what they think they're going to get with athletic fields is not going to be the kind of pristine turf that, you know, that they would ideally want. And so we're going to have destruction of the prairie and kind of subpar fields and that event, you know, no one's gonna come out of this being happy. I I would defer to, Derek, are you still here? I would defer to Derek on, on that in terms of, of how that would be sodded. Um, Yeah, I, I, it, there, there's a, a lot more to, to look into to, to that question. I think that's from Julie. Um, Julie, what what I what I can tell you for sure is that the, the, the athletic fields we have at Brookings today, being least ones, are, are also in, in, in uh, or not also, but they are in, in pretty rough shape. They're, they're uh, very uneven. Um, so uh, I think with uh, proper uh, preparation and grading. Uh, areas in Weaver Park could be made to be uh, much better than, than the least fields we have at Brookings today. Um, but more to come on that, and I appreciate the comment and concern. I think there's probably going to be ongoing, you know, some of those prairie roots are are very deep, like 10 to 15 feet. And after 20 years of, of like having time to grow um, and establish that that I think that there's just going to be a lot of disappointed soccer players. Eventually, you know, it's going to be a lose-lose. Like we're going to lose the prairie and their fields are going to just have problems. Or you're going to have to use a lot of herbicides um, to kill the prairie, you know, to make it turf. That's going to end up in the wetland and they're still just going to be, you know, that, just you're going to be ongoing issues with keeping that those athletic fields a, in a decent shape just because you are building on established prairie. Interesting comment. Um, 
know that all of so you can put in the soils if you want to get your soil for any other questions or comments? And thank you guys for being so open to doing so. Um, it's been great so far. And I'm glad to have this opportunity to let the community in between the bird people and then also Derek from the UPD to talk around with this issue. So um, thank you, everyone. But we'll stay on for another 10-ish minutes and then um, we'll have um, the meeting in. But then again, I have this recorded. So this will also be uploaded on the YouTube, I hope, by tomorrow morning, if not by tonight. So um, thank you, guys. Oh, yeah. He's a super burger. I mean, I guess if there's no other comments or questions, we could go ahead and end, but I'll give you guys another minute or two in case there are. Um, um, if not, you can follow up with us via email with me, or and I can get you in touch with people, or just email Audubon in general, and I can send a link to the... Um, all the links that Henry had on the last uh, slide of his presentation. Um, but if not, you can email us with your questions or concerns or reach out to the UPD. Um, but like I said, just if you want um, the links that Henry sent, just email us at Audubon and I can get those sent to you whenever I receive them. So um, but I'll open up for one or two more minutes of questions or comments and we'll be done for the night. Just gonna say one last time, just nice job, Henry. Yeah, I, I believe he he just left, but uh, oh, he left too. Yes, yeah, it's because yeah. <laughs> he's in Colorado. He doesn't care about this issue anymore. <laughs> <Right? laughs> no, but I also, I also, I, I, I mean, as you, as you probably know, Kirk, I'm, I'm a pretty prominent birder. So I mean, but I, I completely agree with everything you said earlier. Um, I just want to re reiterate that. So, um, but I, I do agree with. Um, at least what you were talking about earlier. That is very something I haven't really heard yet, but I, I totally agree. Well, I guess I'll just go ahead and end it then. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. For those who are left, um, like I said, just email me with any questions or comments. And then also I will be uploading this on YouTube um, in the next 12 hours. So anyways, thank you everyone for coming and um, hope everyone has a great uh, weekend. So thank you.